and my dear friends in the whole world, no matter where you are, no matter what time you are, welcome to get on I can act the talk the stage. We connect the world and the universe by our science and technology. Uh, this is Alice Zhang from Peking University. Uh, warmer greetings from China. Uh, now today you see there I gather dress is a little bit special. It's shiny because it's our tiger's year. Chinese New Year. So, uh, Happy New Year as always. And uh, today is very special because this is our first, uh, you know, uh, talk in Tiger's Year. So, yeah, uh, we uh, already have a bunch of the talks uh, aligning for this Tiger's Year. You can see on the screen. Uh, so, uh, the whole year the talks was fixed and we all have uh, many, many uh, world famous speakers. We all have uh, some uh, uh, great event and uh, we will host different talks on this stage. So uh, you follow this uh, calendar, you will hear all this year's talk and uh, you will, you know, get a lot of uh, science and technology at once. Uh, I think this is a great, you know, platform for everyone uh, to, you know, who likes science, uh, who enjoy all this, you know, high tech. And uh, <clears throat> this spring, uh, we uh, started with applied nanotechnology. So uh, we will have uh, for, uh, five speakers. And uh, in these uh, five weeks, today we start with Chad Merkin, the famous scientist in the nanotechnology. And uh, next week, we will have a scientist, Paolo Somori, was from France. And I uh, going to talk about the 2D materials. And then we will have Justin Harness, was from uh, John Hawkins. Then we will have uh, uh, John, uh, <coughs> Sam Woo Kim, was from uh, uh, Korea. Then we will have a, a female scientist that was from uh, Japan. He's the uh, uh, inventor of the jaw of the uh, solar gel. And uh, and March H, we use a colorful, you know, the flowers because that day is International Women's Day. We will have a women's session, meanings, uh, names, roles in science. So yeah, this is going to be happened in this next uh, five weeks. And uh, we will have our summit. Uh, we plan this summit actually in the last December, but unfortunately, uh, uh, due to the COVID nineteen, you know, couldn't made it. So uh, we will make this uh, ICAX summit and spring uh, in April twenty sixth to twenty nine and Wuhan, China. Uh, we already confirmed the uh, plenary speakers all from uh, uh, international level, very very famous Professor uh, John Pierce Vach uh, was a Nobel laureate, and uh, we have a Stephen Hale. Uh, was uh, uh, Nobel laureates too. We have a uh, Professor Gang Chen from MIT. We have Professor Jack Leach from Australia. Uh, we have David Leahy was from uh, UK. Uh, we have uh, you know Mix was uh, uh, makers was uh, from US. We have a uh, Li Hong Wang was from Caltech, and uh, all these professors will deliver talks on ICAX summit. We all have a big you know go together uh, enjoying science. And uh, also welcome the people listen to this talk. You can uh, submit uh, your abstract two pages uh, before the March 15. So you also can join this big uh, event and uh, big go together for the summit. Uh, so that's we planning for these two months. Yeah, will be a lot of fun. I hope you enjoy. And today uh, is our first talk. Yeah, we invited the most important people to get on stage to deliver this first talk in Tiger's year. So as uh, uh, Professor Chad McKean, now my I pass my you know job to you, uh, Paul Bass. Paul, uh, my great friend, are you there? Yeah, please. Okay, okay well, Paul. welcome, welcome everyone to this uh, New Year's uh, set of talks and and happy happy Tiger New Year. This is our 86th ICANX lecture, if I'm uh, counting correctly, and it's a special treat today to introduce a close friend and distinguished colleague, Dr. Chad Merkin, one of the world's leading nanoscientists. Chad is the director of the International Institute for Nanotechnology and the George Rathman Professor of Chemistry, Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering, Professor of Biomedical Engineering, of Material Science and Engineering and Medicine at Northwestern University. We've known each other since Chad was a graduate student and I was beginning my academic career. 
Chad is a member of all three U.S. National Academies, Science, Engineering, and Medicine, as well as a foreign member of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. He served on the President's Science and Technology Advisory Board for President Obama. He's won a plethora of awards, both for science and for invention. He's prolific in both. He was an associate editor of JAX and an original editorial advisory board member of ACS Nano. He's both a pioneer in and champion of nanoscience. And it's my very great pleasure to turn the floor over to Professor Chad Merkin. Chad? Okay, wonderful. Thank you uh, for the really nice introduction. It's a, a pleasure to be here uh, and a, a real honor and privilege to be the first speaker in the uh, uh, Year of the Tiger. Um, I thought what I would do, well, first of all, I, I want to thank uh, uh, and, and say that, 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 that both uh, or all of you guys, Alice, Paul, uh, Martin, uh, Chung Ung, and, and Lon have, have just done an incredible job of, of putting together a, a service for the community. I think these ICANN talks are, are, are really, really quite impressive and, and just an unbelievable, maybe the best example of, of, of scientific outreach out there today. And, and so I, I truly do consider it a, a great honor to be able to be here and, and, and talk to so many people um, and tell them a little bit about some of the things we're doing in the area of, of, of nanotechnology. And I thought I'd, I'd spend the next hour telling you about a story um, that really started about uh, 23 years ago. Um, and we, we did not see it going to where it is today. So I want to talk a little bit about that, that particular path. Uh, but then I want to spend the bulk of the time talking about where I see it really moving in the future, because I think there's a very, very big future for it. Uh, and this is, is ultimately all about uh, figuring out how one can sort through the enormous number of combinations of materials, nanomaterials out there to try to identify uh, structure function relationships that have not been identified before, and ultimately to identify new materials that can make a difference in many different areas. So I think I have something in here for almost anybody uh, generally interested in, in, in materials and, and nanomaterials in particular. So I like to say that, that uh, everything we do in this particular area starts with one tiny drop of water. Um, back in the late 90s, um, we uh, discovered um, a, a process, uh, invented a process, a technique that we called dip pen lithography. Um, and we were, uh, at, at the time, studying water transport involving scanning probe microscopes. Uh, they had just become commercial tools. We had access to them at Northwestern. I learned how to use them. My students learned how to use them. Um, and uh, I had a, a really talented uh, postdoc, a guy named Richard Piner, uh, a physicist by, by training. This, I think, emphasizes the importance of, of multidisciplinary interaction. You know, I was a chemist certainly just a pure chemist at the time of, of this particular effort. Um, and uh, I forget what the, the origin was, but we, 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 had a, we had a strong interest at the time in, 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 in looking at uh, the topology of surfaces. Uh, and he had uh, engaged an AFM um, a, 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 and, 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 and put the, the tip in contact with the surface. And uh, he was an interesting guy, he was actually a big pipe smoker. And uh, he went out uh, after he engaged uh, the AFM with the surface to, to smoke a pipe uh, and then came back in uh, and did a survey scan. And when he did, uh, he saw what appeared to be uh, a droplet. In fact, it was a, a metastable droplet of, of water. Water had collected at the point of contact um, and you could actually image it, uh, which was uh, somewhat uh, shocking at the time because he was basically uh, imaging the result of the capillary effect. Water collects at the point of contact, that's a thermodynamic sink. Uh, when you run an AFM experiment in air, when the tip's in contact with the surface, um, and he was uh, uh, the first to, to really image uh, that, that particular uh, droplet of that phenomenon. Um, and, and he was fascinated by it, uh, and he began to study it, um, and he discovered that uh, one of two things typically happened is the tip was moved across the surface, either water moved from the surface to the tip, uh, creating depletion layers, uh, or water was deposited onto the surface to create add layers of water that were also metastable. And you could create patterns of the water. Um, of course, they, they would disappear over time. And, and, and uh, from a chemist standpoint, uh, that wasn't very interesting. So I looked at this and, and said, you know, this is usually viewed as a major problem in scanning probe microscopy uh, because it convolutes 
um, measurements that you make. Remember, the instrument was, was uh, developed uh, to get topological measurements of, of a surface. Um, and, and from a chemistry perspective, it'd be a lot more interesting if we could learn how to transport molecules through or over that water uh, to a substrate. So we could create chemical gradients where molecules that were preloaded onto the tip could chemically react with the underlying substrate. And at the time, there was a lot of interest, of course, in gold thiol type chemistry, and that seemed like the perfect type of system to study this with. And sure enough, it worked. And what we found was that we could controllably deposit materials in, in monolayer form onto substrates. And, and, and so you could create really tiny volumes of materials on surfaces and add layers that were not metastable, but stable uh, indefinitely. Um, and that was the birth of, of, of dependent lithography. And, and the, the historical significance of that um, is uh, pretty important because uh, it's arguably the first time um, anybody had ever used a scanning probe microscope uh, for additive manufacturing to basically uh, build structures on surfaces. Remember that we, we, we typically think of these types of tools as, as, as topological readers. Um, it, it was, they were also used to damage surfaces, but here you were constructively building matter on a surface. Uh, even different from uh, uh, spelling out of IBM in, in the old days using uh, 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 low temperature STM. There you're pulling up and moving. Here, direct deposition building structures from the bottom up. And that's important because that began to um, sway our thinking or influence our thinking in terms of what we could ultimately do with this type of technique. So I need to now bring you up to speed because a lot happened between now or between then and now. Um, and uh, I need to also give credit to, to other, other folks as well. Um, so if you kind of look at the development of, of writing tools, um, first of all, Alice is always happy about this. This goes all the way back to China. Uh, much of what we do today uh, are just highly miniaturized forms um, and simplified analysis of, of what was done many, many years ago, uh, but they're important forms. Um, and, and so dip pen was an interesting tool because as I said, it allowed you to customly uh, uh, make uh, uh, nanostructures on surfaces and at the very least became a, a tool where you could study the consequences of miniaturization. And it was used by many groups, uh, including ours for, for many years to do that. At the same time at Harvard, George Whitesides was developing uh, techniques like micro contact printing. Uh, these are not competitive techniques. They're actually highly complementary techniques. Contact printing uh, is a, a parallel method, allows you to pattern over large areas, but does not allow you to pattern at the resolution of a dip pen type of experiment. So one is very custom, the other is very parallel. One is very high resolution, the other is relatively low resolution. Um, so those two techniques were being developed in parallel. Uh, we actually even commercialized dip pen analithography. There are tools all over the world uh, used to do it now. Uh, the Enscriptor by Nano Inc. in particular, um, and, and we were about to to basically quit and you know call it a day and say, hey, we've done as much as we can possibly do here. We'd actually taken the these types of tools from single cantilever types of tools to ones that had as many as uh, 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 fifty five thousand uh, cantilevers in a square centimeter chip. Uh, people like Chang Lu. Uh, uh, an engineer who moved from Illinois to Northwestern to join our effort actually helped significantly in that particular area. Um, but then we got an idea. And the idea was that maybe we could merge some of the concepts from contact printing with dip pen to create something much better. And that turned out to be a really important idea. And that was the birth of something we call polymer pen lithography. The basic idea was that instead of creating a stamp, an elastomeric stamp, you could create an array of pyramids, elastomeric pyramids mounted on a glass substrate or a transparent substrate that could take the place of a cantilever in a conventional scanning probe instrument, not even an AFM, a much simpler instrument. And so if you had then the ability to laterally move with nanometer precision and to move up and down with nanometer precision, you could begin to think about using the tips as point sources to locally control chemistry underneath. That was the birth of what we call cantilever free scanning probe lithography. It really changed everything because now we had an incredibly high resolution custom tool that could allow you to pattern over large areas, square centimeter areas. 
It also changed how we thought about doing scanning probe synthesis and, and fabrication in general, it led to what we call desktop fabs. Pretty soon we realized that we could use these pyramids, the backs of them, as light addressable entities and squeeze light through the backs of the pyramids through the nanoscopic tips and control photochemistry in the near and far field on the other side. That's powerful because now you truly do have the equivalent of a desktop fab. You can use tens of thousands of beams of light using a digital micromirror device to independently control each tip. So you don't just have to make copies, you can make uh, really anything you want. Each tip basically controls a different quadrant on the substrate. Those are now commercial instruments. So that was really exciting. It led to the development of some powerful 3D printing technology that I won't talk about called HARP. But then it really caused us to think about this in a different way. When we first started, we were thinking about, you know, can we create a nanofabrication tool? Can we create uh, a desktop fab? We were thinking about it from, you know, the electronics industry primarily. But we began to put our chemistry hats on and begin to think about this as a chemistry tool. Could we begin to use these tips as ways to locally control chemistry so that you could begin to build massive libraries, libraries of materials uh, with an enormous number of, of structures, a, a density of which we've never seen before, something more sophisticated than the more, most complex, most information-rich uh, genomic chips developed through, for, through, through the genomics revolution, but geared towards materials and materials discovery. And that's really gonna be the story today. So here's the challenge that, that I want you to think about. Um, when we, we, we think about the number of combinations of elements that, that define the materials that we use today, there are an enormous number of possibilities just looking at the different combinations from the periodic table, the useful elements from the periodic table. But when you throw nano in there and, and, and accept the fact that at a fixed composition, when you miniaturize structures uh, over a certain length scale, they will have different properties. When you change their shape, they will have different properties. When you change their phase structure, the distribution of the elements, they will have different properties. The parameter set is, is enormous. And then you think about what we're doing in terms of discovering new materials and how much the world relies on it. Uh, we are moving at a shockingly slow pace. We typically uh, attract really smart people into our groups, uh, ask them to use their intuition, synthesize materials, test their properties, uh, find what works, what doesn't work, and then refine around that. And that works. I mean, we, we, we can find some really important uh, materials with important properties using that particular process, and we have. So I, I don't mean to say that this is going to be gone. Um, but there are a couple of observations uh, that you can make when you kind of step back and say, well, what's the problem with this? One, as I said, it's too slow. Uh, if you think about the, the number of materials that we've characterized as a civilization to date, inorganic materials, it's less than a million uh, made and characterized, uh, which is a shockingly low number when you see the number of possibilities. Uh, two is, uh, although we've developed high throughput methods, our high throughput methods are ra remarkably slow in comparison to what I'm going to share, share with you today. And then three is with the advent of machine learning and AI, um, we are not making use and we can't make use of the data sets that are out there to really empower researchers to objectively search through the materials genome and find the materials that matter. Um, and so one of the things I want you to think about is uh, there are no large scale, high quality data sets uh, available to train AI or machine learning for accelerating this type of process. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we can use technology enabled through these printing tools that allow you to do this in, in a, I think, a very significant way. At least that's our hope, and that's basically the story. So, you know, how big are those numbers? Uh, well, it depends upon the parameter set you look at. I just took an example here, uh, one, four, and seven component particles. Uh, you look at, at just the number of, of, of combinations of, of useful metals in the periodic table, the number gets pretty large, 436. Um, million. Um, you uh, look at, at, at compositional changes uh, in increments of 5% and 7% or 5% and 
um, uh, you, you go up to uh, 1.8 times 10 to the 13. Uh, you throw in size increments from one to 50, you get it up to 10 to the 14. And this is a constrained set of parameters. The parameter set is much larger than this. My point is that these numbers are enormous. And, and so you can only conclude that one is uh, we're moving slowly. And two is we're likely finding local winners rather than global winners when we try to find a material that's of, of import for whatever process that we're looking at. Um, so, so the premise here is perhaps we can begin to use these types of tools to build what we call mega libraries, libraries of, of structures uh, that have on the low end millions of discrete features positionally encoded on a surface using those tips, and on the high end billions of features. And again, we can start by using intuition to search the genome, collect that information, uh, and then begin to use that data, which I would argue is some of the highest quality data out there because you can collect under one set of conditions with a mega library type of experiment, to begin to train machine learning and AI algorithms uh, to then begin to navigate the genome more objectively, and then begin to use the synthesis tools, the patterning tools more as a confirmer or a tester of whether the AI is working or not. That's really the vision for, for where we're headed. And I think it's a good vision, and I hope you'll agree with me after I share with you some of the results that we've collected over the last couple of years. And so the goal ultimately of this is not just material synthesis, but it's to utilize these capabilities to build the world's most powerful materials AI. And the, the premise is, is simple, that if we do that, we'll be able to objectively find not local winners, but global winners, and we'll be able to find uh, those discover, make those discoveries uh, 10 to 100 times faster at, at, over a shorter period, uh, a shorter period of time and lower cost. Okay, um, so how do you do this? Um, we've begun to build this capability out at Northwestern, um, focusing on what I like to call three silos. One is synthesis. I'm going to tell you how we make mega libraries using these tools um, and how we can synthesize matter uh, faster than, than anybody on earth. I, I, I like to tell the students that they, they can legitimately say they, they've made more new inorganic materials uh, than uh, all scientists since the beginning of time uh, when they make these types of structures. And, and you'll see why in a second. Second though is uh, with any sort of, of, of combinatorial type of approach, you're only as good as the screening. Um, so there's always a bottleneck. And so we have to develop companion screens. I'll talk a little bit about that. That's how we actually get the data. That's how we find the winners, sort them from the losers uh, and, and begin to navigate uh, the genome. And then the third is we can begin to test uh, whether or not that data can be used to train algorithms where then machines can begin to help us pick and choose what parameter set that we should look at. Uh, we have a great collaboration with the Toyota Research Institute uh, and Chris Wolverton, we're, we're all, and, and Vinayak Dravid, and I'll share some advances there as well. Okay, so, so uh, everything um, that we do in this area relies on what I like to refer to as nanoreactors. And we're not the first uh, to develop nanoreactors. Uh, people have thought about nanoreactors in many different forms uh, over the years. Uh, I like to give Dick Crooks uh, a, a, quite a bit of credit. Uh, because uh, in the early days, he was talking about using dendromers as nanoreactors. And his idea was that you could take dendromers and sequester metal ions within them, uh, and you could use those as local reactors that uh, could control the formation of a particular particle of interest. So post-reduction uh, of those ions would lead then to a nanoparticle encased in a dendromer, and that would allow you to control size with, with tremendous precision. And that actually works pretty well. The problem, of course, with that is that if you want to make really complex materials, it becomes difficult. How do you get the different types of metal ions at the right stoichiometries to go within the dendromers? So, so it's somewhat limited in terms of how far you can go with that with respect to complexity. Uh, other people came up with ways of affecting crystallization. Even Terry Odom did some beautiful work uh, that was published in Nano Letters uh, in, in, in terms of wells in this particular area. Um, and, and you combine that then and say, well, I'd like to also be able to control uh, things like shape and phase structure. Um, uh, people have spent a lot of time trying to uh, make in parallel and solution-based syntheses different types of structures. Uh, and, and we've seen a, a lot of progress. 
Uh, but but at the end of the day, when you start talking about building the complexity of the systems that I'm talking about, it's very difficult to envision how you could do that routinely using any of the methods that currently exist today. And so we had an idea. And the idea was that you could begin to create nanoreactors on surfaces by using first dip pen and then polymer pen to pattern in parallel over large areas. And the idea was that we could develop inks, uh, chemicals, polymers, in this case, polyethylene oxide, poly two vinyl parity, block copolymers that could be preloaded with metal salts of interest, tetrachloroauric acid, for example, is a prototypical example. And in the lithography experiment, we could deposit on the right type of surface, a hydrophobic substrate, for example, uh, appropriately modified silicon, uh, a lot of other materials as well as you're gonna see, uh, a, a reactor because uh, the, these are, are, are aqueous materials uh, and uh, they will beat up. The contact angle is appropriate to create a, a reactor of a, a very well-defined and, and controllable volume in the, in, in the lithographic experiment. And so the idea would be that you could create a reactor that has a really tiny volume, and I'll tell you, we can get down to yoctoliters of volume, um, attoliters routinely. So these are really, really tiny reactors. And then we could post-treat, thermally anneal, for example, under a reducing environment, and uh, begin to reduce the metal atoms, uh, affect coalescence, and if everything worked well, we could drive um, every re uh, uh, reactant within, the metal reactant, uh, to one particle product. Um, and that turns out to be the case. Um, so here are some examples, and, and it shows you that this is, is really quite powerful and, and, and quite controllable. So here are nanoreactors where uh, the diameter is roughly, the height is the same, but the diameter goes from uh, about uh, 170 nanometers in diameter up to about 230 nanometers in diameter. Um, and you can see these are the reactors that have been generated. We did that to ask the question, is this really true? Do, do the atoms, all, all the atoms in the reactor coalesce to form one particle product? And if they do, that means by changing the volume of the reactor, you change the number of metal atoms and therefore you change the size of the particle that ultimately uh, results. And that's exactly what happens. You go from 22 nanometers roughly up to 20, call it 27, 28 nanometers. Um, so, um, I'm sorry, no, to 20, 23 nanometers. Um, so, so, so that was nice. That, that showed we could control a particle size. Uh, we're not really in, into the area that where it's really exciting yet, at least from a, a, a catalytic standpoint. And what some of our early targets, as you're going to see, are, are catalysts. So we began to ask, you know, can we make smaller particles? So we used polymer pen lithography, uh, and we built uh, uh, arrays of these particles where we try to keep the size constant, uh, in this case, 4.8 nanometers. Uh, and, and you can see that we created a, a dispersion. You can actually uh, count all the particles. Uh, and, and, and get great statistics because you make so many of them at once. We're, in this case, we were using a, a polymer pen array that had 160,000 tips um, and, and just making reactors over and over and over again so, so that, that we could have millions of, 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 of particles that were generated. Um, and, and the dispersity here is better than uh, uh, the best preps out there in solution for making gold nanoparticles. And that's because the lithography is tried and true. It actually works really well. You can control a reactor volume with tremendous uh, reproducibility and precision. Now, that's kind of interesting. And you, you can begin to ask the question, how does this actually work? Uh, what happens? Uh, can I visualize uh, the formation of these types of particles. And I want to make an important point here because this is a powerful new type of surface science tool as well. Uh, because it's one of those rare times where um, you can set up a reaction um, where you have all of the reactants in one vesicle, in one reactor, converting to a single product. So we can monitor trajectories. And here I'm going to show you uh, the formation, the birth and, and growth and formation and maturation of a gold nanoparticle, starting with the gold salt in the nanoreactor. Uh, and in fact, we put this under an electron microscope at low temperature and then slowly raise the temperature to room temperature, um, and you can watch the coalescence process. So if you look here, you can see the little nuclei all coming together, uh, and eventually they fuse to form 
one particle. So we, we can map out trajectories and you might look at this and say, well, that's kind of cool, but what, what, what do I really learn from this? Well, if you break this down frame by frame, I took it out of the talk, I've talked about this in the past. Um, what you find is that you have both ripening occurring and coalescence. The difference being that in the one case, one particle is dissolving, uh, atoms are being freed up and being transferred to neighboring particles. In the other case, uh, particles are fusing. They're coming in contact with one another and fusing. Both processes are occurring, and you can tease that out of uh, this type of analysis, uh, and, and they're distance dependent. So uh, when the nuclei are within five nanometers of one another, coalescence tends, tends to dominate. When they're further than five nanometers, ripening tends to dominate. So I think there's going to be a lot that we can learn uh, by utilizing this just as a surface science tool to understand uh, trajectories involving particle synthesis. And, and we're doing that across uh, many different types of compositions and, 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 and material types. The other thing that's important is I've only talked about single component systems, but what's really powerful here is what you put in the polymer ends up in the particle. And this really shows that. So we then began to load the polymers up um, with uh, different ratios of uh, gold, silver, and nickel salts. Beginning to ask the question, can I make multi-component particles and can I control composition by doing this? And so if you look here, these are the results in terms of the particles that are made. Here we're trying to make a particle with 20% nickel and a gold-silver ratio of one to one. We keep the gold-silver ratio constant as we go from left to right, and we increase the nickel content from 20 to 80%. Incredibly controllable. What you put in the polymer ends up in the particle because all of those atoms go into making that particular particle. It's also kind of curious, and we're not fully sure why. You don't get two particles. You could have envisioned where you got a nickel particle and, and, and the gold silver particle alone, but you don't. The conditions of this force the formation of these types of heterostructures. And these heterostructures have interesting properties both in electronics and also in, in, in uh, uh, well, in optics and, and, and catalysis as well. So that's an observation I want you to hold on to as well. And then we began to push it. And I had a really talented uh, uh, student, a guy named Peng Chen, who's now at Berkeley with Peidong Yang. Um, and, and he began to ask the question, can we truly navigate the genome, the materials genome, meaning the different combinations of elements, to different sizes and so on and so forth. And so he made a, a seven element library where he made uh, uh, most of the single component, two component, three component, four component, five component, and one seven component particle at a fixed size. And you can see these particles. They're, they're kind of tortured materials. Uh, they're not alloys. Uh, they consist of, they're all heterostructures with different types of domains uh, with the phase segregated elements that, that define them. Um, the vast majority of these have never existed on the planet before. Uh, that's, I think, profound observation number one. So you can make materials faster than anybody else out there. That's clear. And you can make materials that we haven't even explored out there because a lot of these materials you wouldn't want to make until you knew they were worth making. And I think that's an important point here. People say, well, this isn't a, a, a scale-up tool. It's not a scale-up tool. It's a discovery tool. But I need to know what I want to make before I go put the effort into ultimately making it. And so that's where this is going to be quite powerful. Now, you might say, well, what do I learn from that? Um, you actually learn quite a bit. First, you get a lot of fundamental information. You begin to build libraries like this across compositional and size space. Um, and and you, you can begin to learn, for example, a lot about structure. And so one of the things, if we look at this, um, the, the design rules uh, come out of just an analysis of this library that, that were, frankly, no material scientist or chemist uh, uh, could have made or could have predicted without making this library. Uh, the first is that for a polyelemental nanoparticle, the number of possible interfaces is between n minus 1 and n times n minus 1 over 2. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, if, if I have a two-phase particle, I can only have one interface, you know, and I'll see that, right? Uh, I'll either get an alloy or, 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 or a heterostructure um, with two phases and one interface. Um, but if I have a, a three-phase particle, I can have a system where I have two interfaces and three interfaces. So for example, the striped and the, the pie-shaped particle. And we see both those, depending upon the elements that are out there. And then if I have a four-phase particle, I can have three, four, five, or six interfaces. And you see all of those as well, and we've identified all of those. 
We then began to work with Chris Wolverton uh, to try to figure out why is one favored over the other. So, for example, if you look at this uh, 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 three-phase system involving silver, copper, and cobalt, uh, the pie-shaped, uh, I'm sorry, the striped structure is favored over the pie-shaped structure. Uh, and that comes down to a balance between surface and interfacial energies. And through an understanding of that, you can predict which path you're actually going to go down. The one that's minimized is the one that's ultimately favored. The third is that uh, by, and this is more qualitative, but biphase structures alone cannot be used to predict triphase structures. Um, so so uh, the, the simpler libraries don't give you a lot of, of, of information in terms of the hierarchy going through those particular systems. But if I look at four here, interfaces not observed observed in tri-phase nanoparticles, we've never found. They do not exist in multi-phase nanoparticles. So by understanding the hierarchy level, we can begin to understand or predict uh, what are some of the possibilities as we increase uh, uh, elemental complexity. Okay, the next question was, could you begin to really work on the size? Because a lot of the action in nano is the smaller you go, the more interesting it gets. Uh, especially in the catalysis regime, and 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 there's a problem. Is we you know in, in our idea of this, we could keep making the reactor smaller, and diluting out the metal content, and by doing that, we could um, decrease the size of the particles. And that's true to a point. When you when you get to really tiny particles, you run into a sampling problem, at least with the old way that I was talking about, because I can't load up uh, the the polymer in a, a homogeneous way when the number of metal atoms is relatively small compared to the number of sites within the polymer, the pyridine groups, for example, within the polymer that we're using as the ink in the reactor. And so Pung came up with a, a really cool idea, which was maybe we could uh, make this uh, 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 less of a sampling problem if we worked with polymers that were end capped so that each polymer chain effectively had a single metal atom. And I could literally count the number of polymer chains that define a particular reactor and therefore cross correlate that with the exact number of metal atoms uh, that define a, a particular reactor. And that could lead then to a tighter control over particle size. To do that, uh, he created uh, this polymer shown here that was end capped with a porphyrin. And he chose a porphyrin because a porphyrin uh, can be loaded up with different types of metal ions. That would give us the flexibility to begin to mix and match different polymers uh, so that I could uh, create reactors that had the appropriate stoichiometry to get particles of a set size and also composition. And you can see this works, just three examples there, platinum, nickel, platinum, copper, platinum, copper, and nickel. Um, they're really uh, high quality structures. If you look over at the right here, it's re really remarkable. These are the reactors here going from 60 nanometers down to really uh, less than 20 nanometers. Look at the particle sizes. Now we're getting you know, four nanometer particles all the way down to um, sub one nanometer particles. Whoops. Uh, we're getting down to a countable number of atoms in the particle. Okay. I think we're going to be able to take this all the way down to single atom chemistry. And I think that's going to be exciting because we can begin to control where individual atoms are and then clusters of atoms, two, three, four, five, six. And you know, this whole dream of, of, of watching the evolution of properties, I think, is going, to be, is going to become possible in a really high throughput and highly controllable way, you utilize these types of techniques. But for now, we can say we can get down to really tiny particles. We have to use aberration corrected electron microscopy. Uh, to, to, to identify the structures of these, but the good news is we have phenomenal facilities at Northwestern that allow us to do that. The next question is, you know, what, what are the limitations? We, we, and we don't know. And I, you know, I, I can only talk about the limitations today. Uh, what I can say is that um, it, when up to the point that I've described now, we were good at making these structures in the middle of the periodic table here. We couldn't make these uh, structures uh, in, in gray and in brown uh, and, and also in green, um, uh, there were problems. Um, uh, so, so in the red, uh, we've got materials routinely accessible by scan, what we call scanning probe block copolymer lithography. That's the technique for making the reactors. Uh, the, bl the, the blue are hindered because they, they exhibit low mobility, so they won't coalesce under the conditions that we, we typically uh, had used. Um, uh, the, the orange uh, are susceptible to hydrolysis, the precursors are, 
the gray are not reducible under the reducing environment we're using the hydrogen. Um, and, and with the green, uh, we, we've got volatility issues. Um, so the question was, is there a way to get around that? The answer is there is. Uh, this opens up a whole new field of chemistry uh, where you're beginning to try to understand how you match the solvent conditions, reactor conditions with the lithographic experiment with the results that you ultimately want to obtain. Um, and so uh, we began to develop new ink formulations uh, that would allow us to expand the number of possibilities. So for example, by moving from the conventional uh, uh, block copolymer to a, a, a sulfalane solvent uh, with a, a polystyrene nanoreactor, a non-coordinating polymer, um, that allowed us to make a variety of different types of materials that I'm going to share with you today. Um, and then we found out that we could uh, move from silicon substrates, which were our, our, our early substrates that we investigated, to things like alumina. That's important for a couple of reasons. For, uh, many people interested in catalysis, for example, would like to work on other types of substrates like alumina. Uh, but we could uh, uh, create substrates that had the appropriate uh, um, uh, hydrophobicity by modifying them with perfluorinated phosphonate groups. And that was a trick that allowed us to create uh, uh, surfaces that uh, were compatible with the types of, of materials we, we were working with and also allowed us to create uh, reactors with the appropriate um, uh, uh, contact angle uh, to, to affect the process that I alluded to or something similar to what I alluded to. And, and below you can see some of the results. And now, now we're beginning to make iridium, rhodium, tungsten, many of the materials that we, we, we couldn't make before. Um, and so we're going to push down that path very aggressively in the years to come as well. Um, the next thing we wanted to do is we wanted to ask, you know, can you take these types of particles and, and post-process them? I talked about shape as, as being important, and, and that's true. Um, so, for example, in the catalysis arena, uh, oftentimes you don't want to work with the rounded particles. You'd like to um, work, work with structures with high index facets. Um, and and you, you'd like to work with structures like the one shown here, these tetrahexahedra. Um, uh, we developed independently another method that allowed us to take these types of particles and convert them from rounded spheres into tetrahexahedra, uh, which is really quite interesting and useful regardless of whether you're using this for nanocombinatorics. Uh, for example, just taking a platinum fuel cell catalyst and reactivating it. Uh, this is a process that works because it's a ligand-free process. And basically what you can do is you can take precursors on a, on a substrate in a tube furnace let's say an array of, of particles that we've made via the scanning per block of polymer lithography process. And you can put a boat upstream of it that has a trace element, antimony, bismuth, lead, or tellurium. You can flow argon and hydrogen over that boat in, at elevated temperature. Uh, uh, that volatilizes the trace element and it alloys with the particles of interest. Um, and uh, Liliang, a, a really talented uh, uh, graduate student uh, who's now also at Berkeley, um, sounds like Berkeley is the is the depository of, 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 of talented grad students, but that's not the case where they, they go all over the world. Um, those uh, uh, particles now have uh, that trace element in there in, in alloy form. And then over time, as you continue to flow the argon, you, you get rid of all the trace element and you begin to de-alloy uh, from the particles that trace element because it's the most volatile species. And when that happens, all these rounded particles reshape into these tetrahexahedra. Uh, and, and, and it's pretty remarkable. You can, you can see uh, that, that we have the ability, regardless of whether they're single element or multi-element systems, we can convert these particles, all of them from their low index to high index states. Uh, and, and from, as you're gonna see from a catalytic standpoint, low catalytic activity to high catalytic activity. Uh, and this is all in a ligand-free type of environment. Uh, so that's important from a poisoning standpoint. So I think this alone is a really important reaction that's been discovered that can be widely used in the nanomaterials field in general. What about other materials? I've just talked about metals. Uh, what about perovskites? They're, they're an interesting class of materials. Well, we can't use the conventional polymers to do that, but we can use uh, the, these solvents, these low volatility uh, uh, solvents, uh, DMSO sulfalane, for example, uh, as an ink. Um, we, in a polymer pentic uh, uh, lithography experiment, we can deposit reactors that are filled with the precursors for the halide perovskites, um, uh, and then allow crystallization to occur in the reactor as opposed to this high temperature uh, 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 coalescence of metal nanoparticles. Um, and, and here we've uh, uh, found that we can 
uh, basically build libraries of these types of structures, as you'll see. Up here, you can see, again, the control, hundreds of thousands of, each one a single crystal, all positionally encoded on a surface. That's gonna be important from a device manufacturing standpoint as well. Uh, a, 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 again, another talented material science student, uh, Dong Hoon, uh, uh, drove a lot of this work along with uh, 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 folks like uh, uh, Jordan Swisher and Min Liang, who actually came from Peidong Liang's, uh, Yang's group. We, we trade a lot of talented grad students. Um, uh, and, and they made a, a, a tremendous amount of progress. Uh, and, and then these are, are particles that are not just pretty in terms of, 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 of position and composition, but they, they actually uh, 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 emit uh, as you would expect them to, uh, and they emit depend upon composition and size and other types of, 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 of parameters that we can control in these experiments. Um, we, we can make uh, almost everything uh, uh, in, in terms of, of this particular area. Uh, we have the methyl ammonium, lead, uh, uh, iodide, bromide, uh, and, and chloride versions here. We've got the, the cesium versions. Um, uh, and, and you can see over here, um, you, you can dial in by controlling composition and size, these single crystal fates that, that control the emissive properties over here uh, on the right. Um, uh, now, you might ask, well, well what, what is there to discover in this area? There's a lot. Um, so, you know, one is, you know, what, what is the right composition, structure, particle size to give me the most optimized set of properties, stability, safety, uh, and emissive properties? Um, and uh, one of the things that we figured out we can do is we can build a, a library of uh, uh, all the same particles may be varying in size. Um, and then we can use a laser uh, to affect uh, photo defects uh, in, in the particles as we scan across the array. Um, and depending upon a radiation time, power, um, we can control the number of those defects. And then in mass, we can exchange the bromide in this particular case with chloride. And so we can begin to build really uh, incremental changes in terms of composition across an array that is systematically varying in terms of size. Uh, in utilizing this particular technique, we've built a library now of 4,000 different particles, uh, and we've begun to optimize and identify structures uh, that have uh, blue emission uh, uh, based upon uh, particle composition and size. And again, it's not one or the other, bromide or chloride. It's a, 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 a small variation that ultimately leads to a significant difference in terms of optical properties. And you can kind of see that right here. Um, so if we look at this, um, we, we built this library and identified um, structures uh, that are optimized in terms of their emissive properties. So this just shows you how you can begin to look at, in addition to structure, optical properties of these types some materials and related uh, architectures. Uh, and, and so from the mega library, we've discovered this particular composition in the lower left uh, as the optimum one uh, with respect to blue emission. Okay, uh, what else? I, I mentioned catalysis. So one of the things you can do is use these types of techniques uh, to effectively build um, systems that allow you to screen for catalytic properties. And the first way you can use this is to design catalysts. Uh, and so you might be asking, can you make enough of this where you can probe uh, catalytic properties? Um, well, we asked the same question. We, we looked at the library of materials that we made, the, the, the different uh, metal uh, ratios, and, and we asked uh, uh, Chris Wolverton to uh, look at those structures and begin to give us some targets based upon DFT calculations for reactions of interest. And he said, well, let's focus on the HER reaction, the hydrogen evolution reaction. And we can simply look at which of those materials in that library that I shared with you before would have a high affinity for hydrogen. And so here are just some examples of, of single, two, and three element particles. And, and in this particular case, you're trying to beat platinum. Platinum's king. And if you look at the hydrogen affinity, you can see, well, it's no big surprise. Gold, copper, nickel, not so good. They're not very good HER catalysts. You move up here, some of these two and three component systems are pretty good. Platinum is still pretty high up here, as you'd expect it to be, but it's not the highest. You see platinum, gold, nickel, and platinum, gold, copper. And so that became a great test scenario for us because we could go make these compositions on a glassy carbon electrode in mass, and we did. 
We can identify and characterize them over here. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. And then we can look at their catalytic properties and simply look at their over potentials and compare them to platinum and ask, are we as good, better, or worse? And it's kind of interesting. If, if, if you look at the results, uh, it's remarkable. Remember, if I go back, uh, we had platinum, gold, nickel, and platinum, gold, copper here. If I look at the behavior here, you can see that all those two component ones that I showed you, they're not very good. This is the over potential. We're comparing two platinum. So you'd like to be down here or preferably below here. Um, but if you look at this, uh, none of those guys suffice. Even one of the ones he predicted, the platinum gold nickel, that's up here. That wasn't very good. So you can't use DFT calculations alone. But look at the one, this other one, platinum gold copper. On a per platinum atom basis, it was a record at the time, which is kind of interesting. So we've been able to identify a structure that is better than platinum. Being as good as platinum without as much platinum is a step forward. Now, the question, of course, is why was he wrong? And why did this you know, give us these two very different results? And the reason came from the simulations are only as good as the inputs. He modeled them as alloys. And the great thing about this type of technique is you can actually characterize the structures before, during, and after catalysis. And what you can see is the platinum gold copper, which was the good one, is in fact an alloy, whereas the platinum gold nickel phase segregates and gives you this heterostructure. It's actually a two component particle fused to a one component particle. Um, and it behaves that way as well in terms of its electrocatalytic properties. So a lot we can learn about structure function correlations as well. So if you're following this, the bottom line is we're building out synthesis capabilities and beginning to build screening capabilities. Metals, metal oxides, sulfides, other types of nanostructures, halide perovskites, quantum dots, up conversion nanoparticles, all of those have been made. The question is, can we now begin to build these mega libraries, these chips that, as I said, have more information content than really the most sophisticated geno genomic chips ever created for the genomics revolution? And I wouldn't be here if the answer wasn't yes. So we've begun to do that. And we're asking now, can we begin to use those capabilities to now create chips that allow us to navigate the materials genome and then scan and collect those properties and that data that ultimately feeds AI and machine learning algorithms. And so I wanted to share a couple of results with you to give you a flavor for what we've done here. This is in fact, one of the first mega libraries that we've ever produced. We did it with the Air Force, Benji Mariyama at, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and his group there. You'll see why we worked with them. They had a great sc screening technique that we could utilize. You might ask, how do you create a mega library that systematically varies in composition? The way we do that is we take a, a, light, a, pen, a pen array and we, we spray coat onto the pen array gradients of the precursor materials, the polymers of interest containing, for example, the different metal ions of interest. You flip that around now, put it in the instrument for patterning, and now you can create nanoreactors that systematically vary in terms of size and metal content. And so that allows us then in one shot so if you have a, 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 a tool that allows you to make, you know, for example, 160,000 nanoreactors in a fraction of a second, in a matter of minutes to hours, you can create reactors that have literally hundreds of millions of possibilities and convert them all into particles and in mass. Now, this is where the Air Force came in. They had a Raman technique, and they were interested in asking the question, could we find new catalysts for making single-walled carbon nanotubes? And they wanted to explore the gold co uh, copper compositional space. And so we said, well, we can make every variation of gold and copper within a reasonable uh, set of increments. Uh, and we could systematically control particle size as well and, and begin to ask what are good catalysts and what are great catalysts and what are intermediate ones along the way. And they have this uh, array detection system where they effectively have a whole series of posts that you put the mega library on. And then as you go from post to post to post, they can look for Raman signatures associated with product formation, the single walled carbon nanotubes, for example. And they could control the conditions, the temperature, uh, the reactants, methane, ethylene, all sorts of things that were carbon precursors that come in to look at those conditions as well. And so you could collect a tremendous amount of data very, very rapidly. Now, what do you get out of this? It's kind of interesting. This is the typical plot. And the first thing you discover is that there are a lot of catalysts for single walled carbon nanotubes with gold and copper compositions. But I really wanna hammer this point home. Only one is a global winner. So if you looked at these just through intuition, you might find an intermediate one and conclude I have a great catalyst and, and I'm as good as I'm gonna get. From this data, you find that it's actually gold three copper 
rises to that and then drops very quickly. Second is you can get the appropriate particle size. I didn't put it on here, so I forget what, what the optimum was, so I don't want to misstate, but you can get the, the optimum particle size as well. And so this shows you, this was a million different compositions and sizes, all screened in mass, creating a tremendous data set that ultimately informed what the global winner was and differentiated it from local winners. So I think that's important as well. Um, oops, yeah. So, so where we're headed with this is then, can we begin to utilize this, not just to take shots on goal and screen by brute force methods, but can we then begin to utilize this capability to uh, effectively define what we call the metaverse with mega libraries, collect data, high quality first party data that, that ultimately trains machine learning algorithms to now allow uh, ML and, and AI to navigate through the genome and then ultimately use the lithography uh, and the mega library type of approach to validate or not and improve on that. And, and if that's the case, we, I think we can have a really big impact in terms of how materials are ultimately discovered. And I, I just give you a little glimpse of that because we, we, we actually think we can do this. And we think it because Toyota came to us, they were watching what we were doing. Um, and, and this is from the Toyota Research Institute, a whole team of researchers there, I'll, I'll talk about them at the end. Um, they were uh, saying, hey, you know, you guys are, are, are making materials faster than anybody else out there. And, and the data looks like it, it's all collected under one set of conditions. So it's really high quality. It's not like mining through a bunch of old data sets. You know, I call you garbage in, garbage out. You need to have, you know, everything collected under one set of conditions. Uh, why don't we see if we can use our AI team to begin to mine uh, those data sets and, and create algorithms that make predictions that you know chemists and material scientists couldn't make. So we went to that seven element system that Peng Chen made. Uh, remember the tortured particles and, and looked at the phase structure and used uh, a lot of the structural uh, uh, data there as inputs for algorithms. And to make a long story short, um, we trained algorithms and first began to uh, uh, challenge those by asking the machine to predict things that we knew were correct. Uh, and it did a pretty good job with the three and four element systems. But where machine learning and AI uh, really do well is, is when you really have a, a multivariable type of system. Take, for example, the seven element system. And you were to ask it, instead of giving us particles like the one shown here that we'd, we'd made, what if we wanted to create uh, uh, two phase particles with a single interface? So two alloys with a single interface butting up against one another. What would be the right elements of the uh, seven with six as a necessary requirement and the right stoichiometries? Uh, well, the machine could spit out answers and, and, and we could go make those and test whether or not it was accurate or not. And in this case, it predicted 19 different possibilities. We made all 19 and characterized them. 18 of 19 were correct, which, you know, frankly, blew us all away. We, 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 we would have been happy if, you know, a third of them were, <laughs> were correct. Um, and I, I think it's important. Uh, it's important for a couple of reasons. One is no material scientist or chemist on earth could predict that. Okay, so, so you're using the data and you're using the algorithms to now make predict. This is the most sophisticated uh, 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 two-phase particle ever made, uh, six elements in this case. And, and it, it just, the, the wherewithal it does not exist uh, to, to make that type of prediction. Uh, the second thing is I think the prospect for using this to identify not just structural uh, 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 properties, but, 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 but catalytic and optical properties and other types of properties that are important for many different types of applications, I think are, 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 are important early targets. Oops. Okay. So let me, let me uh, just finish with this last uh, uh, little video. Um, one of the things we're doing, as you can imagine, we've thought a lot about this and, and we think this is going to be highly impactful. We translated some of this in the form of a startup company called Stokia. And, and I, I'm, I'm not only shamelessly advertising here because I want you to be aware of this because I think it's a really exciting company, um, but I want to show you what they've done because they've taken what we've done at the university and done something pretty impressive. They've created what, what they call the discovery factory, uh, which is putting all of this together from uh, how you look at things as possibilities, how you build the libraries, how you collect the data, and, uh, how you identify the catalyst, and ultimately how you scale them up. And it'll give you a feel for where we're headed in this particular area. And I thought I'd play just a few minute video just to give you a, a, a feel for where they stand and then conclude. So let me see if I can get this up.
Welcome to Stakia's Discovery Factory, where materials discovery is being transformed using our proprietary mega library technology. A mega library is a two by two square centimeter chip with 225 million positionally encoded discrete materials, each of a well-defined size, composition, and structure. Each of these materials is a candidate for various applications, such as catalysts for CO2 utilization or green hydrogen production, more efficient materials for batteries or solar cells, to name just a few. Let us tell you how we make and screen mega libraries to identify the best materials amongst billions of possibilities. The first step in creating a chip-based mega library is distributing material precursors of interest onto a print head with 90,000 nanoscale pyramidal tips that act like pens. By repeatedly engaging the array with a substrate of interest, we generate billions of nanoscale features that can be subsequently converted into new materials, each systematically varying in size and composition. To accomplish the first step in this process, we have developed an in-house spray system along with an optimization algorithm. The algorithm finds the optimal spray conditions to create the entire set of material combinations the user wants to explore, and then triggers the fully automated spraying platform to coat each of the 90,000 pens with a unique, well-defined combination of material precursors. The pre-ink print head and is soon to become mega library are then loaded into Storkia's proprietary mega printer. When brought into contact, each pen deposits a controlled volume of ink onto the chip, resulting in 90,000 precursor-loaded nanoreactors in less than a second. 225 million nanoreactors when the process is repeated 2,500 times. In a post-processing step, the nanoreactors are all converted in parallel into an array of discrete material candidates with positionally encoded size and composition. The next step in the process is to screen materials within the mega library for functional and structural properties of interest. Heat mapping popularized in the genomics field is one of the methods being used for high throughput analysis of mega libraries. Using colorimetric indicators, the intensity in each pixel of the mega library chip can be used to infer the performance of the materials within that pixel and help quickly identify hotspots for further investigation. Now, to simulate commercially relevant conditions, we use site-isolated scanning electrochemistry to confine small areas of the chip and interrogate electrocatalytic properties. This technique provides a high throughput analysis of the relationship between the electrocatalytic properties of the materials and their given structures and compositions. Importantly, using this method, we obtain a comprehensive understanding of a catalyst performance, including activity, selectivity, and stability. All of these metrics are important when considering catalyst scale-up and deployment. Critically, this one instrument can generate hundreds of thousands of structure function data points per day. In just the few minutes you spend watching this video, we will have acquired hundreds of new data points, each bringing us closer to the next enabling electrochemist. Once promising catalysts are selected for mega libraries, they are scaled up by bulk synthesis methods and stress tested in commercial electrolyzers and fuel cells. In this case, electrocatalysts of interest are spray coated and electro deposited onto high surface area commercial membranes and electrodes, and their stability, selectivity, and efficiency are validated under electrolyzer conditions. To accelerate the exploration of the vast material space, we train AI models to guide us towards the best material for a given process. The data employed for training these models is gathered through proprietary software from our ultra high throughput synthesis and screening experiments, ensuring the quality of data sets being compiled. As data compounds, the AI continuously improves the speed and accuracy of its predictions, becoming more efficient in directing experimentation towards the most favorable materials and the minimum number of iterations. You just witnessed the discovery factory in action. As we scale the factory, the pace at which we create and characterize new materials, generate novel structure function data, and unlock the predictive power of AI will accelerate. Ultimately, the discovery factory will provide the optimal answers to any material problem, faster and at a fraction of cost of what's possible today. There we go. 
Okay, so 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 that really kind of sums it up, and, and it kind of uh, it brings you up to date in, in terms of where we are. Uh, I, I just want to uh, finish by uh, acknowledging uh, um, really the enormous team of, of people that that have, have contributed to everything that I talked about today. Um, I don't even have all of them throughout the years. This is my current group here. Uh, I, I do want to acknowledge, though, uh, Chris Wolverton, Vinayak Dravi, really critical people in terms of the computational work that you heard about uh, and, and the characterization work. Uh, Benji and his team, Raul, and the Toyota team, um, uh, uh, Mirathan uh, Joseph and Santosh and Steven, uh, all critical in terms of, of, of building the AI capabilities. Uh, the current students and postdocs and, and a lot of the, 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 the talented alumni. And of course, uh, our funding sources uh, with the Air, Air Force, AFRL, GSK in the early days, Kairos Ventures helped out uh, through a gift, uh, the Sherman Fairchild Foundation, um, and the Toyota Research Institute all, all, all contributed to, to getting us to where we are today. I would stop there and I'll be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much. Now what I would like to do is uh, introduce our panel. Uh, Alice, you'll, you'll take over the screen. So in fact, for today's celebration, we have all of our hosts uh, coming out. So I'm um, uh, Paul Weiss from UCLA. Uh, next, we have Martin Tuo from okay. Iowa State uh, joining us. And on the next slide. Lan Fu from Australia National University. We have our uh, ex-challenger today, uh, Dr. Uh, Chang Hong Kao, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and the director of the McGill Nanofactory at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. His research interests include experimental nanomechanics, low dimensional materials, micro and nano manufacturing, as well as additive manufacturing of advanced materials. And so let's uh, bring everybody out here. And we'll start with Dr. Kao. Thank you very much, Bell. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Merkin, for the fascinating, inspiring talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I have uh, two questions here. Uh, so the first one is, uh, I was wondering while you were talking, like you showed a lot of the, uh, the screening of the properties of nanoparticles you know, like a particle itself. I'm wondering, have you uh, studied the interactions between these uh, particles, you know, same particles, different particles into clusters, you know, monolayers or 3D dimensional, what's gonna happen there? Yeah, so, so we, we've actually been focusing on the opposite. So, so everything that, that uh, I've talked about here relies on the fact that each particle is positionally encoded and isolated from other ones. Um, we're, we're trying to, to identify uh, the correlations between uh, the structures of individual particles and, and their properties. You, you, you bring into question a, another possibility, which is can we begin to uh, look at the cooperative properties of, of, of different types of, of, of particle-based materials? Um, in the current uh, format of this, it's not really set up beautifully for that, because if you think about it, you generate a reactor, right? And then that reactor gets converted into a particle uh, that is much smaller <laughs> than the reactor. Um, so the, the, the pitch, uh, the, the separation between features uh, in some respects in its current state uh, is limited and dictated uh, by the size of the reactor that you use. Um, and and so, so most of these particles are, are truly site isolated from one another. Uh, which is good for what we want to do, but not necessarily great for what you're, for what you're alluding to. Yes, I'm thinking probably some uh, self-assembly technologies, you know, onto the substrate somehow where you, after you deposit the particles, then they can coalesce by itself. Somehow. You, you, you could do that. Actually, you could merge some of the things that we do in the DNA area where, where you post modification, you could then begin to build particle by particle structures uh, up. Uh, but I'm just saying that you wouldn't lithographically do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for that. And my second question is, uh, um, so you you mostly focus on, I saw some, you know, maybe you didn't show Hall, you know, so properties on the optical properties and some other properties. I'm thinking, uh, are you interested 
interesting exploring the, uh, for example, the thermal properties and mechanical properties of these particles and uh, how we listen. We're, 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 we're interested in it all. I mean, so, so, so the premise, the whole premise behind Stokia, and frankly, between what we're, what we're doing at the university is to ultimately creating, you know, to ultimately create a, a, an answers generating machine. Um, so if, 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 and, and the, the, the premise is that with the AI, if, if, if you have this, these data sets, you keep building a more and more educated AI, that AI can be taken down different paths. In the early days, it'll be structure. Later, it'll be catalysis. Then it'll be thermal properties. Then it'll be optical properties. Uh, and the more inputs that we add, the greater the capabilities. That's, that's the dream, to ultimately create an answers capability utilizing this ability to generate materials faster than anybody else out there and to collect high quality first party data faster than anybody else out there. Uh, that, that's kind of the, the, the vision and, and the excitement about what we're, we're, we're currently doing. You know, we'll see how far we can go. And we're gonna learn a lot about, about possibilities and limitations, but yeah, we're just in the early days focused on what we think is most impactful and most doable with the data that we have in play. Structure was the first thing to focus on. Catalysis is the obvious second. Uh, we're, 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 we've got major efforts in the clean energy space. Uh, can we find catalysts for CO2 reduction using this particular thing where we convert to specific products with high activities? Uh, can we uh, uh, create modes of creating green hydrogen? Uh, and and, and, and from, a, from an answer standpoint there, you could say that the challenge that we're trying to take on is can we replace iridium? Iridium is what's used in the electrolyzers right now. There's not enough iridium on the planet to meet the world's needs. So we need to find an alternative to iridium. And we think this is going to be the, 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 the path to get there. Yeah, thank you, Rob. Uh, yeah, I definitely can see the you know the expansion of the possibilities like into different dimensions like properties and size and you know you know lateral and three-dimensional so yeah and there, um, and there are massive teams being built all, all around the world uh heavily at northwestern we're building a whole nano combinatorial center I, I i every time i've only given this talk uh, uh two or three times but every every time i do it there, there are groups that come and say you know i i'd like to look at this particular area and so we, we've begun to forge relationships with folks to try to open up new territory by by collaborating because they might have a they might have a great high throughput screening technique that can be mapped with this uh, that would provide additional sorts of data that we can't get with the screening techniques that we currently have or they might have a a target in terms of the material or material properties uh, that we haven't thought about um, it, to me it's 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 a it generates a, a tremendous amount of interest and curiosity very quickly because you're no longer limited by the one at a time type of approach. It's it's do it in mass and 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 uh, let the let the library tell you where to go. Okay. Thank you very much. Very nice. Let's move on to Professor Lan Fu, one of our ICANX hosts. True. Thank you, Paul. Oh, thank you, Professor Merkin, for sharing such a fascinating journey in developing this really powerful tool. Uh, my question is when I see when you give few examples that um, when you have this multi um, mat uh, metal particles forming together, you form these heterostructures. And then you also give example about perovskite, which is um, apparently is a, a like compound type of thing. So how this really happening is what determining that formation of this kind of um, structure is the materials property themselves or is actually your um, processing parameters, which one is actually uh, dominant the result basically? Well, well as I said, I, I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, to me, it, it was kind of curious that, 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 that with the um, complex heterostructures um, that we, we could have either gotten those or we could have gotten just a bunch of isolated particles that never fused. So the, the sintering conditions, the coalescence conditions, uh, the choice of polymer, the choice of, of, of temperature and, 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 and reaction conditions uh, lead to that particular outcome. And it turns out to be a great outcome because otherwise you just have a mess. <laughs> um, and, and, and to be honest, when, when you look at a library, when, when Pung did this, you know, 80% of them are, 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 are what we talk about, the, the, the particles, but 20% are, are, are what I just described. Uh, so, so it's not a perfect process in that regard. Um, but because you get so many uh, duplicates, um, uh, and that's if you li listen to the video, the, co the company approach is <clears throat> they're not just making one particle per site. They're making 2,500 versions of each of those. 
you can burn a lot of duplicates within a mega library because you have you know, a lot of real estate on this scale to work with. Um, and what that means is that you can get a, a statistical representation of what that particle composition is. Because uh, what some people often ask is, what about orientation? When you have these complex particles, you know, you roll them around in different ways, different uh, faces are exposed, and that might lead to differences in catalytic activity. Exactly. So, so, so the, the duplication effort, the ability to, to have many, many duplicates uh, uh, allows you to at least uh, take that into account and, and not miss a great opportunity or pass on a great opportunity because you had the wrong orientation. Right. Yes, it's very complex, I can tell, and it's <laughs> very difficult. Uh, my next question is about uh, semiconductors, because you, you touch on a little bit that's, that's like the green area where you find, because the volatility of the materials, it, um, it makes some challenge. But uh, my, my question is, like, if you can make perovskites, uh, that's probably a bit more volatile than semiconductors, so what is the um, real limitations that because of the leaning temperature? No, it, it, no we, we, we've made semi, so we make quantum dot uh, particles, right? We, we've made uh, big libraries of, of, you know, cadmium sulfide, cadmium selenide. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that um, the, the story is still being told, but, but, but I, I think almost anything you can make by conventional synthesis, you're gonna be able to make on tips. Um, it's going to require, as I said, a, a development of you know clever ways of, of of creating conditions that mimic those on tips. But we've done enough of them now um, where I, I, I'm convinced that's going to be possible. That if if you have a desire to move in that particular area, you can come up with a clever way of doing it. I can't say that we can do all of that yet now, um, but but uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident we're going to be able to get there, and and I think the students are as well. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Let's move on to another of our ICANX hosts, Professor Marvin Tuo. Uh, hey, Chad. Thank you. Very nice talk. Uh, very inspiring. Uh, fast. I have two questions. The first one is more towards the people who are up and coming. You know, showing that amount of work and so many fascinating ideas to somebody who is early in their career, they may feel, oh my goodness, when am I going to ever get there? So my question to you is, how do you start such a wrong journey? Do you have the vision at the beginning or do you follow the data and let it guide you? Uh, yeah, you know, or... no, that, that's a really good question. I mean, I always say this is one of the greatest stories uh, that, that just undermines uh, uh, the importance of, or not undermines, uh, underscores, underscores the importance of, mm -hmm. of, of fundamental research. You know, we're looking at water transport back in the 90s, right? We're looking at, at, at esoteric, Sorry, Paul, scanning probe <laughs> measurements that, 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 that Paul would get excited about, I would get excited about, but the vast majority of the world would say, oh, great, you know, they're looking at water transport. And that led, that created the whole foundation for this. Okay, oh, now we can make things additively instead of, 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 of you know, damaging a surface, instead of just reading a surface, you know, we're depositing things, we're doing chemistry on a surface. Uh, oh, okay. I can use that to uh, create a, 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 a simple, a simpler version of, of, of a microfabrication capability that can be used at the point of use. That becomes kind of the next connection that's made, and, and then you parallelize and you start looking at this and go, "Well, I can do that faster." Okay, that's good. That's engineering. Oh, wait, no, I can use this as a synthesis tool. So, so it, it's it's not being satisfied with what you do. It's saying, "Okay, I learned X." What does that allow me to say about why? And, and, and just keep questioning and questioning and questioning and asking how far can I go and what can I do with this? You know, and at some point, you know, this is where I guess whether you're a, a good leader or not, you have to make the decision to punt or not. I think a lot of people punt too quickly that, mm -hmm. that uh, uh, they, they, they give up and, and don't see the connections all the way to the end. And, and I, nobody, in the, no, nobody could have told you in 99 that this type of tool would be the world's best synthesis tool. <laughs> it just was not in the cards, was not even in the thinking. But having a lot of people keep pushing and challenge, what can we do with this? How, what, what do we understand now that we didn't understand before? What capability do we have that we didn't have before? And how do we push and how do we show the world or, or test for the world whether or not there, there is a real capability here or not? That's, a, I think, just an important part of the whole 
scientific discovery and, and invention process. And, 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 you know, I hammer that home. And the other thing is, you know, you, you, no, nobody is, is the owner of all great ideas. <laughs> uh, and and we, we live by that in the group. And, and, and uh, uh, you know, I challenge everybody that comes to the group, you come with a new perspective, you come from a different a field in many cases, bring those skills and techniques uh, uh, and don't just follow the path that we're going, ask how you can use those. And I'll give you one good example of that. So we're looking for catalysts now with color metric indicators. So imagine having a mega library and you run a catalytic reaction and you generate different types of products. Let's say in the case of CO2 reduction, methanol, ethanol, ethylene. How do you screen for that? You could screen for activity like we did for the HER catalysts and just look at you know, uh, uh, where do we have the most current uh, lowest over potential? But that doesn't tell you anything about selectivity. I had a, a, a student come from uh, Chris Chang's group at Berkeley, and, and he was developing colorimetric sensors for biological systems. And he said, you know, we could develop colorimetric detection systems that floated over the library and were product sensitive and gave you an optical signature so that in mass, you could look at all these particles doing catalytic and where were we generating the products of interest? We couldn't get that any other way. And that's really, really fast. So having it not now that isn't, isn't high resolution, but it tells us where the active sites are. And then we can expand those active sites and, and re really look at them in, in, in more detail. And so, so that's an example of, of, you know, having people from different fields, making connections, taking something from the biological arena and bringing it to the materials discovery and, and the scanning probe synthesis arena. So I think that's important as well. Very good. Uh, maybe my last question is uh, also related to what uh, Professor Lanfu was asking about the, the, the heterogeneous structures. Whenever you have a small particle and, and, and then you create multiple component, you generate a lot of surfaces and interfaces and those are uh, thermodynamic and metastable uh, because they don't belong on either side. Have you, have you looked at uh, any, what is the uh, energy state or mic uh, or structure or well, I can tell you, we, we view oh. most of these structures as thermodynamic products. They're generated at really mm -hmm. high temperature. Um, the one case where that's not the case is if we have elements that are volatile, and we do have some of those where, where as you heat, <laughs> you're, you're getting rid of that. That's actually one of the way we discovered the whole um, uh, trace element uh, conversion of spherical to, 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 to tetrahexahedra. Um, those are, are structures that are really dynamically changing over time. And so you have to kind of pick a stopping point uh, for those. But most of these are, they truly are uh, uh, thermodynamic structures. Okay. Um, uh, and, and while there may be some mobility, uh, um, they're about as uh, close to, to, to a thermodynamic minima as, as possible because you're making them at a thousand degrees. All right. Thank you very much. Those are my two questions. Terrific. Let's move on to Professor Alice Sang, our host. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, very nice talk. I actually, I got questions from the students, the audience. Okay. I asked the first question is from one student. He want to know, you know, when you synthesize the nanoparticle down to one nanometers, and uh, uh, he want to know what kind of parameters you control in your process. When you go down to one, um, yeah. so 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 the, the big issue there was switching solvent uh, mm -hmm. and going from a, a polymer that had many metal affinity sites uh, to polymers that were end caps, so that each polymer strand had a single metal atom. So being able to reduce the, the ratio of metal atom to call it solvent and reactor <clears throat> allows you to more finely control uh, the number of atoms that end up in the particle of interest. Um, and then we were simply mixing uh, different polymer precursors uh, that had different metals in the porphyrins to create the combinations of elements. Uh, and we've gone up to, to three different elements in those tiny particles. We, we were primarily focused on can we control particle size more tightly in that particular work as opposed to trying to make the expansive libraries. Um, we are down to about 22 atoms, um, uh, and, but there's a challenge and, and a steak dinner uh, on the table for any student or postdoc uh, or visiting person who takes us down to a single atom. 
<laughs> yeah, that was a big, uh, big, big, big issue, a breakthrough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it's doable. The hard part is Alice's is characterization, right? So, so the, the the cool thing about this is you you know it's got to be in the reactor. That's the great thing. So, so you know the site to look for. But, 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 but you're really challenging the the the, the, the characterization techniques uh, to to prove that you've actually got what you think you what you did. Even even I guess that would be a very hard. small stake, though. Huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it won't, it won't be Gene and Georgette's, which you'll recall is large. Okay, there are another questions from the students. Is uh, they want to know if you can, uh, if you consider to make you, you know, the AI process to be an open source. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, there'll be components of it that are. Yeah. So, so the AI that we're doing with Toyota is is open source. Um, the AI that they're creating uh, commercially through Stokia, um, I don't think they fully uh, decided that. I, I, I sincerely doubt it will be open source, but uh, uh, I don't know. I, I think that, that that's that's a company. But the stuff we do at the university, um, uh, all is open source. Okay, thank you very much. That's a question from students, all this. Thank you. Okay, well, I'll take the chance to ask ask a couple here as well. So you alluded to the importance of screening and I was wondering if you had some fantasy about what it is you'd really like as a, as a screening uh, tool or technique. Oh, I mean, I, I know characteristics, you know, fast, large area, um, and yet the ability to get information at the individual or small collection of particle level. Um, cause those are all the trade-offs, right? So, so sometimes if you go big and you go fast, you, you, you lose resolution, you go a really high resolution, you lose speed. Um, and, and so, uh, we're chat, you know, the Nyack and those guys are coming up with all sorts of clever ways to get structural data fast. That's, that's a challenge, right? Cause you want to, you know, depends on what, what sort of structural input you want, but if you want to get down to the atom level, you're talking about a lot of time per, per particle, right? Um, if, if you're just looking at general structure, uh, it's a, a different level, and if you're looking at, at ensemble properties, and you know where is the where is the local hotspot, that's a different uh, level of resolution. So, so it's really it's always a combination of those, and, and you're getting it. I mean, the, the the right now, I'd say we are more limited by uh, the throughput of screening than anything else, um, right. and that's really important for everything that we want to do in terms of identifying promising hits, but also getting the data. Right, because uh, that 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 is in the, in the you know, data factory concept that 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 really is is a limiter. So, um, what I love about this is it it, it creates a, a beautiful convergence of of synthesis considerations. People that you know like to make things, people like you that like to measure things and, and figure out um, um, you know what makes things tick. Uh, 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 there's gonna be a lot of I think clever innovations that come out of this because of the challenges created here. And then the third part. Which I'm just learning a lot about myself is 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 how far we can go with the AI and machine learning and and, and what the limitations are there. Very good. And I'll ask one uh, question on behalf of the trainees out there. You're about to get several hundred thousand applications for your group, <laughs> and so <laughs> let me ask you for them what it is you're looking for in people you bring in to your research group. That's a really good question because everybody thinks you get such great people, and you know you must spend just tons of time looking at, you know, part of it is Northwestern has a process to, to get people into graduate school. I trust that process. So, so once people are in, my main thing is personality and, and interest and excitement. Do they share the enthusiasm for science that I share? I, I think they're above the bar in terms of smarts and they're ready to go. Are they going to like our, the philosophy of our group and, and, you know, which we, you know, work hard and we have fun. <laughs> uh, uh, and and that, those are the two, 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 two uh, pre prerequisites and, and work smart. Um, uh, but, but, but uh, I don't go through a, uh, a real detailed analysis of it after they're in. Now when postdocs apply, you know, it's looking for somebody who's done something uh, pretty special at where they are and, and, and where their advisors and the people around them say that one is they're good scientists, they're hard workers, they're energetic, enthusiastic people and people that, uh, you know, want to 
really do science uh, uh, at a high quality, high, uh, high level, and, and at a pace that's commensurate with what we want to do, and, and, and good things happen. We've been able to attract a lot of really good people through the years. Terrific. Well, thank you for the amazing talk and wonderful science. And you know, I want to thank our panel for uh, everything you've done to put these uh, talks together, and especially for today's. It's been yeah, a couple no, I, of years. I, I, can I say one thing? Of course. Because I, 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 you guys really deserve a tremendous amount of credit. I, I, and I, I didn't fully appreciate this until I got involved in this, but what you guys have put together, I, I think, is is just an incredible service to the scientific community. Maybe uh, the greatest example of, of outreach and 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 high quality uh, spreading of the word. Uh, out there, and it's 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 impressive, and, and the commitment is is, is remarkable. And I'm not just saying that to make you guys feel happy. I, I truly, truly believe that, and especially for Paul, who's getting up at four o'clock in the morning to to, to do this. It, it's it's a, a pretty impressive feat, uh, uh, both of commitment and and and, and accomplishment. So congratulations. Uh, well, thank you so much on behalf of Alice and her team and all of our hosts. Well, it's been. Uh... I think next month will be two years since we've seen each other, which is probably the longest gap since we each started our academic careers quite some time ago. And we look forward to seeing you in San Diego. Uh, usually we uh, are able to meet in Chicago or LA. And I think our last meeting was, was in Chicago. It was my last uh, business trip before uh, COVID started. And so normally I'd be able to walk across the stage and hand you a plaque. Uh, unfortunately for now, uh, we only have this electronic uh, certificate uh, to thank you for this talk and to, to uh, commemorate it. So thank you so much. And I'll look forward to seeing you at the ACS meeting in San Diego uh, in, in uh, just a few weeks. As Alice mentioned at the start, uh, we have a, a wonderful uh, program uh, continuing with Paolo Samori uh, next Friday uh, from uh, Strasbourg. And uh, you'll see for uh, the rest of this uh, section of the ICANX talks, uh, we'll focus on nanoscience. And uh, we have the uh, ICANX Summit uh, coming up in April. So stay tuned for that as well. We have a terrific program uh, put together for that. So uh, thank you all again, uh, wherever you are in the world, uh, whether it's uh, morning, afternoon, evening, uh, enjoy the rest of your Friday. Uh, welcome to the Year of the Tiger and to the ICANX lectures. <laughs>